Good afternoon. Please stand for the national anthem performed by Grace Furland. Oh, say, can you see by the dawn's early light what so proudly we hailed at the twilight's last gleaming? Whose broad stripes and bright stars through the perilous fight or the ramparts we watched were so gallantly streaming and the rocket's red glare the bombs bursting in air gave proof through the night that our flag was still there oh say does that star spangled banner yet wave or the Please welcome to the stage, Jeremy Hutchinson. Wow, thank you, Grace, that was beautiful. Uh, just another round of applause for Grace, please. Hello and uh, good afternoon. It's an honor to welcome Mayor Pete Buttigieg back to Rochester. My name is Jeremy Hutchinson. I'm a newly reelected city council here in Rochester. Thank you. Thanks, Peg. But that is, actually isn't the title that I'm most proud of. I'm a service member of 17 years, serving the United States Air Force. Thank you. I'm a military spouse, serving alongside my husband, Emmy. Thank you. And I'm an Iraq War veteran. Those are some of the titles I'm most proud of. And it's my honor to share with you today my thoughts on what it means to serve and how taking care of our veterans should be our nation's highest priority. Back in July, I had the honor of hosting Mayor Pete on a downtown walking tour of our city. During that tour, I was struck by our many similarities. We had both grown up in Indiana. We were both the first openly gay men to represent in our elected positions, and we had both served overseas. So on this day when we honor our fellow service members, I'm sure, feel, I'm sure Pete feels the same complicated emotions that many veterans have today. My story, I deployed three times. The last as a combat medic in Baghdad, Iraq in 2006. What was particularly interesting about that deployment, though, was instead of caring for U.S. and coalition forces who were injured in the line of duty, it was my job to ensure those who likely perpetrated some of the most heinous attacks against our forces remained alive for intelligence gathering operations. This experience was a complete paradigm shift in how I viewed my contribution to the mission. In many ways, I felt I was betraying the brave men and women I served right along with, the ones who flew many medical missions to Rheimstein Air Base in Germany, taking care of those who were badly injured and broken. I remember begging an Army medical group 
to allow me to go with them outside the wire on one of their missions. I wanted to see what they saw, and boy did I. But they did warn me. They said, be careful what you wish for. There are some things you can't ever unsee. Some see more than others, and some carry those burdens for others. And that year, that unit lost their medic during their deployment. I remember an Army colonel telling me, Sergeant, never measure your contribution to the fight by your proximity to the battle. I was one of the lucky ones. I made it back, and I had a relatively easy time adjusting to civilian life. But it was certainly an adjustment. I had trouble with loud noises and crowds. Certainly sleep was a problem. But I was also struck by how bright and beautiful the colors were here back at home compared to Iraq where everything is dull and drab. I remember having an immense amount of survivor's guilt. Why was I allowed to live and others not? But there are plenty who have it much worse than I do. Currently, I'm attached to a National Guard unit and sadly, the National Guard has the highest rates of suicide among all military services, quite a grim distinction. While the overwhelming thanks that veterans get when they return is appreciated, what they really need is support. We ask our soldiers, airmen, sailors, and Marines to do jobs that most wouldn't do. And we have a responsibility to take care of them after they complete their mission. But it's clear our obligation to care for these same brave Americans is not met with the same level of commitment. We must do better. I have too many friends who have been affected for far too long and who are still working through their experiences while deployed and what they witnessed and how are they going to move past it. And the gaps in our care when we come home certainly contribute to the things that we all see in the news, suicide, homelessness, and substance misuse, which is often used as a form of self-medication. The greatest tragedy, however, in our story as a nation is when those who have answered the call to serve become homeless. What kind of country have we become to allow someone who has risked everything to uphold our nation's greatest values to become homeless? So on this Veterans Day, let's do more than offer thanks. Let's deliver solutions and provide care that we promised to our veterans. Pete is one of the only candidates to have served in the current war that we have yet to end. So it is an important perspective that he has that is far often too missing in the national conversation. Our nation deserves a leader who understands what sacrifice means and how to honor the promise we made to our service members. As we neared the end of our tour, all those months back in July, Pete shook my hand and thanked me for showing him around our city. And he said, please let your community know help is on the way. On this Veterans Day, I hope we can tell our federal veterans that help is on the way. And I welcome the solutions that Pete will put forth today. And that's why it's with great excitement that I announce to you my public endorsement for Pete Buttigieg, our next Commander-in-Chief and President of the United States of America. Thank you. Thank you very much. So at this point, I'd like to introduce a fellow veteran, Thomas Gary, who served right alongside with Pete in Afghanistan. Please join me and welcome Thomas Gary to the stage. Thank you very much, Jeremy. Thank you for your service. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for your warm New England hospitality, I extend greetings from the city of wind. <laughs> you may have some, thank you. Uh, afternoon, my name is Thomas Gary, and I'm honored to be here with you all this afternoon. Um, 
I did not serve with Pete in Afghanistan, unfortunately. But fortunately, I did have a chance to serve with him at uh, our reserve unit. Uh, when he first came into the reserves as a newly commissioned intelligence officer, and I was a, a senior petty officer in that unit. Over the years, I have uh, worked with a wide range of accomplished professionals serving throughout the reserves, and I will say that I was never struck by Pete being a young man in a hurry. But he did stand out, he stood out with how attentive and how considerate he was, not just about learning his job, but learning about his junior sailors and trying to best understand uh, both the function of his role as well as how to be able to better lead and guide his subordinates. So if you ask me, and I've been asked to describe Pete, in a couple of words, the words that I think of are thoughtful and curious. And Pete's one of the most inquisitive people I have ever met. He uh, is never one to rush into a situation and show off. Uh, he instead wants to understand how systems and processes work so that he can best fix problems and uh, improve others' lives. Occasionally, Pete and I would chat, uh, share some stories about our personal lives. Uh, once he told me early in his first term as mayor that he filed a permit because he just wanted to see how the process worked. <laughs> he l literally submitted a permit just to get a sense of following the paper and understanding the problems that, whether it's a small business owner or a developer or a resident would have, and being able to figure out, well, where are the problems and how can I fix that? And I can actually still picture the excitement in his voice and in his eyes as he describes watching that paper flow through the system <laughs> and how long it took and what the issues were so that he could better improve that system for others. And Pete realizes that uh, community and values and uh, a culture of belonging are a big factor in what will help us solve the problems in our country. Pete was our unit's fitness command leader, uh, so part of that job was to make sure everyone passed their fitness tests. <laughs> and believe me, he made sure of that every morning. Uh, <laughs> uh, early during, during Pete's term in South Bend, he mentioned to me he wanted to also build a uh, level of trust uh, and encourage a culture of well-being in his community, in his hometown. So he started hosting morning workouts uh, with city employees. That's, I've never seen a rolled up uh, approach uh, like that anywhere else, but uh, I don't know if he had them uh, throwing over tires or engaging in CrossFit, but I, I certainly hope that it was received in the spirit in which it was given. He's also one to never shy away from difficult or uh, tricky questions. My wife is an expert on healthcare and most everything else, uh, but <laughs> earlier in the year, um, she had asked Pete some really pointed questions on, on Medicare, and Pete didn't duck her questions or throw out some quick talking points. He listened and thought through the complications at play and provided some thoughtful answers to where he would like to go as a nation. And what he said that day, strangely enough, was reflected in what was released uh, a few weeks ago in the Medicare for All Who Wanted proposal. So there's no 
experience, I have to admit, like watching someone you know run for president. And I've gotten a lot of questions from coworkers and, and from friends and reporters uh, trying to contradict or trying to poke holes. And I always tell them, with Pete, what you see is what you get, one way or the other. What you see is exactly what you're going to get. And I've watched others get to know Pete, and I, I see them saying the same thing. And I certainly hope you all see the same thing as well. So as someone who has served our country, both in uniform as well as a civilian, I know how important it is for the person at the top to build a culture of shared responsibility and trust, as well as for hopes and ambitions. And if we have an indifferent leader, we're going to have an indifferent country. And when you flip the coin, if we have a thoughtful and considerate leader, we're going to have a more thoughtful and considerate nation. So in this time of vexation, we need a leader who is able to bring our country together so that we together can tackle the mounting challenges, whether it's health care costs or climate change that our country face. So I'm here, today, I'm here today to tell you that Pete is exactly that. And I am honored and blessed to welcome to you all my friend and my shipmate, Pete Buttigieg. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. And thank you so much to my friend and shipmate, Thomas Gary, for agreeing to join us here in New Hampshire, uh, for your kindness, uh, and for uh, helping a new sailor find his feet when I first turned up at Naval Station Great Lakes some, uh, some 10 years and more ago. Thanks to all of you for joining us, and thanks to Jeremy Hutchinson. Uh, for the tour then, for the welcome now, for the endorsement, which I am very honored to have, for your service to your community and for your service to this country. And I want to thank every single person in this room who raised their right hand and offered their service to the United States. And thank you for what you offered to this country. as well as those who love those who serve, families, and caregivers. Thank you for embodying what is best in us. So earlier this year, in my other capacity, my capacity as mayor, I found myself on a stage at a high school in South Bend, John Adams High School, where we held an event for all of the young people about to graduate who had made that solemn decision to serve. Some were enlisting directly, some were preparing to go into the academies or take up ROTC, some were getting ready to sign up for the Guard. All of them were joining an unbroken line of patriots whose service and sacrifice is what we honor and recognize today. They were old enough to commit to enlist or pursue a commission, but to me they looked like kids. And there is a voice in my back of my head that whole time I was watching them saying, do not let them down. Do not let anybody play games with the lives of these young people. These are young people who are going to raise their right hands and make a promise to this country. And that promise is a two-way commitment. Part of that promise is that America will not take their lives and their service lightly. 
that they will not be used as pawns in politics nor as props in a show because this is not a show and it is not a game. It is a promise that we will support our service members throughout their military journey and embrace them when they return and when they leave active duty. And one of the reasons I'm running for president is to be a commander in chief who knows what it is to be sent abroad on the orders of a president, a commander in chief who will keep America's promise to those who kept their promise to serve this nation. Like anyone who used to serve when you see people just beginning their journey, when I was at that event with these young people, it brought out a lot of emotions. It brought out a lot of stories I want to tell, all kinds of tedious nostalgia I had to refrain from inflicting on them. <laughs> and it made me think about that moment over a decade ago when I first tugged on the door of a recruiting office in Indiana. And, of course, the door was locked. I wound up playing phone tag with an NCO in South Bend, then a lieutenant in Michigan. I learned a lot, as many people do when they first join the military, about bureaucracy. <laughs> I, I would even later learn that at one point the Navy uh, took down what I had said about my college coursework, hoping to be picked up for intelligence, hoping to impress them uh, by letting them know that I had minored in Arabic, and they had written this down that I had minored in aerobics. <laughs> Come to think of it, maybe that's how I wound up in charge of fitness over at uh, Fort Sheridan. Who knows? But, by the way, I, I uh, actually did at one point encourage our uh, junior staff to, to flip tires. Um, but when, when the interns started calling it cross -peed, I realized I might have gone too far and just stuck to running. Anyway, I, I kept at it following that, that calling to be part of something bigger. I had felt a tug of service growing up, and it was reinforced when I was knocking on doors in rural Iowa for, for a different young presidential candidate with a funny name. Um, and when I was there, I found entire towns seemed to be emptying their youth into military service and walked away more certain than ever that it was my turn to serve. And so that time finally came when I rose my right hand, raised my right hand and took an oath. And the military that I was commissioned into reflects the best of America. But our relationship with that military also reflects our enduring imperfections. I joined the finest fighting force on earth, and yet America had too often failed to adequately care for or even appropriately welcome those troops when they come home. In fact, this isn't in my speech, but I, I want to say to anybody who uh, is here who served in the Vietnam generation, having come home to balloons and, and smiles uh, at a time when America had benefited from learning how to separate what we feel about those who serve from what we feel about the policies of this country, uh, I am mindful that not everybody who served had that same benefit. And if you were among those who were not received in the right way when you come home, I believe it is better late than never to say thank you and welcome home. <laughs> this has always been a complicated relationship between the U.S. and those who wear the uniform. We spoke reverently of American victories from Lexington to Midway, and yet I knew when I was serving that I would enter a war that was already going into its second decade with no end and no end game in sight and fewer and fewer people able to explain exactly where it was headed. I entered the most diverse and integrated organization I have ever been a part of, but also was burdened at the time of my commissioning by a law that would not allow somebody like me to be open about who I loved while serving the country that I loved. And through all of those contradictions, my service brought me so much closer to my country and to my countrymen and women. And I became the rare mayor, I assume, whose duties occasionally extended to scrubbing toilets. So the status shift did me some good as well. 
in the realm of humility. Everyone does their part, whether stateside or abroad, whether they serve as a reservist or on active duty or both. And when the time came for me to deploy, in the dust of a war zone, I learned to trust my life to people that I had nothing in common with sometimes, besides the flag that was Velcroed to our shoulders. But that was enough. The people who got in my vehicle did not care whether I was a Democrat or a Republican or an Independent. They cared about whether my M4 was locked or, and loaded and whether I had trained on how to use it. They did not care what country my father immigrated from, whether he was documented or not, whether I was going home to a girlfriend or a boyfriend. They cared whether I had selected the route with the fewest IED threats. They just wanted to get home safe, just like I did. And not everybody did. This morning, uh, navigating the white rows of the Veterans Cemetery that we were able to visit today for a very moving ceremony, I found myself again reflecting on a kind of dictatorship of chance that leaves some of us walking on top of the grass while others are beneath it. And it can be hard to think of any satisfying explanation for why some come back and why some do not. There's certainly no morally satisfying answer. But what we know is that every veteran who serves in whatever capacity and with whatever experience they had should be able to expect a level of support in exchange for what they offered this country. And yet those who deploy often struggle to return and fit in in the world that they left. Even for me, with a civilian job and a community waiting for me, my transition was certainly smoother than most. But even for me, it was disorienting. I remember when I would absentmindedly yank the door of my Taurus almost off its hinges because my muscle memory forgot I wasn't pulling open the armored door of a Land Cruiser for a drive around Kabul. I would sometimes, pulling onto a highway or making a turn, ask a, my passenger, sometimes my mother, uh, who would be rather startled uh, if we were clear right before <laughs> making a turn. It was an adjustment. And there were times when I would wrestle with depression when I came home as well. And many veterans find that they have left a conflict only to have that conflict come home with them. It could be a fireworks display that has somebody tensing up. It could be that alarm on the iPhone that so cruelly mimics the incoming indirect fire alarm on our bases. You might be doing your best to reconnect with neighbors and loved ones and yet feel somehow apart from them. And people that you served with may have self-medicated with alcohol or worse. The women and men who come home from war are not unblemished heroes or broken souls. They are people. They are us. They are our fellow citizens who ask to be viewed neither as heroes nor as victims, but as fellow citizens who deserve to be cared for with the care that they've earned and wish for the chance to continue to serve, to belong to the life of their community. People who serve are not a burden. Indeed, they are the greatest asset that America has. And it is the responsibility not only of the government, but of all of us to realize that full potential of those who served right here at home. And when I am commander in chief, we will. In my administration, we are going to keep our promise to our veterans in three ways. First of all, we will support those on active duty and their families as they disrupt their lives and put them on the line to defend our country. Secondly, we will address and heal the wounds of war and ensure that returned service members always receive the care that they were promised. And third, we are going to engage all Americans, not just government agencies, to enable our veterans and their families to thrive. So first, we cannot ask those in uniform to do their jobs well if we're not doing ours. This is why the first pillar of our effort has to be to support those on active duty and their families. My mother grew up as an Army brat, partly at Fort Bliss in El Paso, where my grandfather was a military surgeon. 
I was single when I deployed, but I saw just how hard it can be for a family as fathers raised their kids by FaceTime any way that they could. Mothers uh, went through important moments with their kids over the phone. The constant shifts in military life, the, the difficulty of finding belonging when you were moving to a new school, maybe a new country every few years, the challenge of effectively being a single parent so much of the time. When 80% of military families need some form of full-time childcare, but the Defense Department can't meet the demand, that's not just a family matter. That directly impacts mission readiness. It affects retention. It means that someone is going on a patrol worried about a spouse trying to look after their kids and hold down a job at the same time, which is why the time has come to ensure that every military family has access to high-quality child care. And we're going to train teachers at the beginning of every school year to learn about and account for the unique needs and capacities of kids from military families. Be being a kid is challenging and complicated enough. We can make it a little easier for these children to integrate into their classrooms. We can also take steps to unlock the potential of military spouses. This is not our great-grandparents' military of single men and single-income families. Today, the majority of those in uniform are married. Both spouses tend to be equally educated, and both tend to be breadwinners. And yet, right now, 56% of military spouses are underemployed. That has to change. And ensuring more opportunity for spouses can be done if we act. That means updating personnel policies to offer more predictable training schedules, greater choice of duty stations without impacting advancement opportunities. It means reducing what amounts to an unofficial tax on military service when we pause student loan repayment for spouses who are unemployed due to the needs of Uncle Sam. It means we have to make it easier for a teacher licensed in one state to get reciprocity in another, and providing military spouses the same kind of transition assistance that was available to me as a service member. For military families housed in substandard facilities, including far too often with children exposed to mold or lead, we have to increase federal oversight and hold private housing contractors accountable for the way they treat our military families. It's just not fair to ask somebody to keep our homeland safe if we can't keep our promise to make sure that their homes are safe. And that sense of safety and respect, that has to extend to everyone who serves in our armed forces. Right now, women in uniform still face additional burdens, high rates of sexual assault, isolation, limits to promotion and leadership opportunities. So we must fully integrate women into all dimensions of military service. We have to ensure that they have access to health care. And we are going to shift the prosecution of sexual assault from military commanders to independent prosecutors so that justice is always going to be done. So many black soldiers who fought for their own liberation, Latina veterans who call this country their own, Native service members who serve at higher rates than any demographic group. We've got to ensure that nobody who serves this country is subject to discrimination in this country. It means that we're, we've got to work to promote racial equity, including treating white nationalism as a national security threat, whether it is found in our armed forces or anywhere else in our society. And we're going to protect immigrant service members and their families from deportation and revamp and reinstate the military accessions 
or MAVNI program that allows non-citizens with vital skills to become citizens through their service. Because if you are willing to risk your life for this country, then it is your country. And we ought to honor that and acknowledge it. This past June, I had an opportunity came about unexpectedly where I realized what it meant when I was saying to a service member, thank you for your service and happy pride in the same sentence, and what it took to bring that about. We still have to banish bigotry from our military. So that means ending the exclusion on coverage for transgender medical treatment, including surgery, and lifting restrictions that unfairly affect those with HIV. We're going to restore honorable discharges and benefits to veterans who were dis discharged solely because they were LGBTQ+. <laughs> and having seen the outrage of Americans willing to put their lives on the line for this country, having their careers threatened, by a president who avoided his own chance to serve, yes, we are going to end the transgender military ban right away when I'm your commander in chief. So that is the first pillar. Secondly, when our service members come home and take off their uniforms, we will see to it that each and every one of them gets the care that they've earned. Now, the majority of veterans are actually not enrolled in VA health care because of the dimensions of their service or whether an injury is service-connected or because of financial thresholds. So many veterans cannot afford health care, and over half a million lack any health insurance at all. That is why we will ensure every veteran and every American has access to quality and affordable health care with Medicare for all who want it, while preserving your choice over whether and when you want it. And sometimes service members who have attempted suicide or report sexual assault receive less than honorable discharges as a consequence of that, preventing them from accessing care and benefits. So we must make it easier in those cases to upgrade discharges and make sure that bad paper is not an obstacle to good care after good service. It is also long past time that we build a truly 21st century VA. Sounds like we've got some folks who've experienced what needs to be done. I don't want another friend to have to tell me about being passed back and forth between departments and phone numbers, brochures, and websites. I don't want to ever wake up again to news of a veteran dying by suicide in a VA parking lot when health care was not forthcoming. We can do better than that. Yeah. Now, with 1,600 vacant physician positions at the VA right now, more than 49,000 personnel shortages department-wide, we must aggressively recruit more providers, which means paying clinicians market rate and cutting in half the time it takes to hire them and bring them on board. My administration will streamline and modernize care, and that means that the coordinator who improves data and record keeping between the VA and DOD will have a desk in the White House on my watch. We're going to implement an electronic health system and a patient portal that's actually designed to work for veterans, because you shouldn't have to fight the enemy abroad and then come home and find yourself fighting with a computer and a website. We also need to depoliticize the VA. We're going to have five-year terms for key positions so that decisions are made based on what is best for veterans and not based on whoever last spoke to the president during a golf game or made the right campaign contribution. This is beyond <laughs> politics.
To reach rural veterans, we have to invest in telehealth and offer loan forgiveness that will recruit doctors to underserved areas, whether they are in the VA system or whether they are in the civilian system that treats so many veterans. And as the VA works to support a growing number of veterans over 70, we must take care of our aging veterans better, including making it easier to age where they choose to age. I may be a comparatively young veteran now, but I anticipate becoming an older one, and so I personally want to make sure we get this right. <laughs> and for those veterans who are shadowed by the invisible wounds of war, we are going to guarantee access to mental health care at parity with physical care in this country once and for all. Instead of perpetuating the stigma, we're going to break the silence around mental health and addiction among veterans. We're going to create a culture where it is as accepted and normal to talk about post-traumatic stress or serious mental illness or addiction as it is to talk about a back surgery or about cancer. We've got to take away the conspiracy of silence that has too many people thinking that they're fighting alone. And instead of locking up veterans who commit crimes due to mental illness, we've got to build on the success of veterans' treatment courts that have dramatically reduced recidivism and are what we owe to those who have returned. And there must be funding to support the development of these alternative means to get us out of incarceration and into rehabilitation. And we must do everything in our power to end the epidemic of veteran suicide. That means we invest in veteran suicide prevention. It means we, we support responsible gun ownership. And it means that we develop a 24-hour VA concierge service to guide veterans to mental health support well before it comes, becomes a life-threatening crisis. 20 veteran suicides a day is 20 too many. Third and finally, we are going to engage the American people so that veterans and families can thrive well after they take off the uniform. We will ensure that they can seek education, housing, and employment, that they can use the skills that they've learned while serving, and that they never question whether they belong in the country that they risk their lives to protect. Some of that's going to take federal support. It's going to mean maximizing the benefits of the GI Bill to make it more flexible and to close the loophole that lets for-profit colleges target and take advantage of service members and veterans. It means building on the Obama administration's work to end veterans' homelessness with public-private partnerships. We have nearly eliminated chronic veteran homelessness in South Bend, and we can do the same across the country, and we must. <laughs> veteran small businesses make up nearly 10 percent of all businesses in America. And we will provide further business training and mentorship because we know that veterans and their families are not a problem to be solved. They are talent to be competed for, creating opportunities in our communities when we support them. And we are going, as I said earlier, to ensure that we extend to Vietnam veterans the respect and care that too many did not find when they came home to a nation that had not learned how to separate its feelings about a war from its attitude toward those who served. We've got to ensure that women who have served can access free and confidential treatment for sexual trauma, receive the same VA benefits and services as male service members, and find meaningful employment. I do not want any woman veteran to hear an employer utter those notorious words, you don't look like a veteran, and when I am president, they won't.
But welcoming veterans back into our society is not just something to be achieved with a new law or a new program. It means each of us reaching out to fellow citizens to invite entire communities to help restore the sense of normalty, normalcy and belonging that is so important. After you step away from the community, identity, and purpose that we have on active duty. Now, a lot of folks think, well, I'm not an expert on counseling or on navigating veterans' benefits. What business do I have helping veterans? But everybody is an expert in something. And in particular, everybody is an expert in their own community. In South Bend, we were proud to be one of the first communities nationwide to pilot an initiative called Veterans Community Connections. And the idea was to enlist, so to speak, everyone in the community, anyone who wanted to do a little more than say thank you for your service. Our volunteers help veterans navigate their way around our community, not just finding a job, but a good dentist or haircut or a trombone lesson for their kids, whatever makes them more part of the fabric of the community, because when communities embrace veterans, veterans enrich the life of our communities. In Kansas City, just a few months ago, I saw veterans coming together to build transitional houses and wraparound services for homeless veterans. And there are networks of veteran entrepreneurs right now working to spark the next era of American innovation. Return service members have helped communities recover from natural disasters, responding to tornadoes in Texas, fires in California, floods here in New Hampshire, and I had occasion to call on them during our own natural disasters in South Bend, Indiana. And there is a new generation of veterans who realize that their oath to defend the Constitution that called them to serve in uniform now also calls them to serve in elected office. And whether that is on the school board or in the state house, whether as a Democrat or a Republican, we welcome the service of those who served in uniform. It's across all of the branches. When Democrats retook the House last year, it was thanks in large measure to leaders like Mickey Sherrill, a Navy pilot, Chrissy Houlihan, an Air Force officer, Jason Crow, an Army Ranger, Jared Golden, a Marine. These are leaders who embody the words of America's first Commander-in-Chief inscribed at Arlington Cemetery, who reminded us, when we assumed the soldier, we did not lay aside the citizen. And it is inspired by the engaged leadership of veterans that I have issued a new call to national service to create a million paid service opportunities by the year 2026. I offer that up because I want every American to experience that same kind of connection and purpose and fellowship that I had overseas without necessarily having to go to war in order to get it. We will be better when everybody has a chance to serve, be it in uniform or in a voluntary civilian capacity. A decade or more from now, I want to be able to return to those young people that I saw at John Adams High School in South Bend to find out about how things have unfolded for them. I hope to be retired then after two good terms in the White House. <laughs> And as a young ex-president settling into <laughs> private life, I want to be able to salute their service and look them in the eye knowing that if and when they were called to fight, it was only ever in just and necessary conflicts that kept the peace and advanced American values and interests. I want to be able to tell them, we did not let you down, that we gave you the peace of mind that your family would be secure and settled while you were deployed, I want to be able to tell them we did not let you down in how we made sure that our returning sons and daughters had easy access to the care that they needed. I want to tell them, look and see how your community wrapped you in its arms when you came home and how they, how we, were here for you at every turn. I will tell them, thank you for your service. And I look forward to a day that when I do, I will do so knowing that our nation's gratitude will be expressed not only in our words, but in our works.
This is the future that we together can build for everyone who wears the uniform of our country. That is the America that I am determined to bring about, and that will be my greatest responsibility and highest calling as your Commander-in-Chief. Thank you.